anytime you've got really uh, interesting Carl, uh, Carlson Chambers is going to be talking about Philippine emergency currency from the Second World War. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you might be aware of some of my provides this the last year. I've had everything. And unfortunately, I'm afraid I've gone from a healthy, happy, middle-aged 75-year-old to a uh, somewhat infirm uh, 76 years old. I had a, a, a bad fall on black ice at the very end of the year that put me in a hospital and nursing home for almost two months. I've had atrial fibrillation. I was taking warfarin. Now they've got me on Eliquis. I had the robbery. Now, I kept this stuff at home. It's not immensely valuable. I could see, and I, but I was correct on the, it was stolen, recovered in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I figured no pawn shop is going to take Philippine guerrilla paper money. <laughs> I was correct on that. Every piece was recovered, uh, thank heaven. Some of the other stuff wasn't. And just one, I had a, a broken wrist. That was in July. Just, uh, I've got osteoporosis and a few things. Anyway, okay, let's uh, leave my problems out of it. You can see... You sort of wonder what would, and I haven't found out. Suppose you were, don't forget the Philippines was sort of a self-governing colony, but it was still, there were, uh, you know, a guy from Ohio or Indiana, he's having a nice Peace Corps job teaching uh, mathematics uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Ilo Ilo, shall we say, or Cebu City or some such place, and then he turns the radio on and uh, learns that Asian prosperity has begun as the Japanese call it, uh, celebrated by bombing Pearl Harbor. This is on the morning of the 8th uh, with their uh, different time zone. You want to get to Australia fast, but the only ferries available at Elo are, Elo are ones that will take you to Cebu or Negros. That, that's not as far as you want to go. And what do you do? I don't know. Okay, well, as you're well aware, um, we, uh, the Philippines was using solid currency. We had quite a bit of that sold the other night. I think it was Neil Schaefer. I'm a little surprised that Neil Schaefer isn't here, but anyway, it was his collection of that. This is a rather expensive area to get into. Uh, the stuff that uh, the so-called English series actually dates from 1951 rather than 1949. 49, they came out with the Central Bank of the Philippines, which was just overprinted on victory notes and uh, done at the BEP. Uh, I think the printing was done in Manila on the Central Bank. So I regard them as simply a continuation of the American series. They're also quite expensive if you, about the same price as the victory notes. Okay, well, uh, let's, uh, let's first start with a, uh, a let's see now, I press which one to advance this? Oh, uh, pardon me, which, which advance is this? The one on this side. Oh, oh that, sure. Oh, I, oh, I know it's it's okay. Uh, for those who aren't perfect on your Philippine geography, oh, that does the same thing. I had an article in here. There were, I can't believe it, with the so-called new generation notes that they're they're now using. They replaced the so-called new design notes. Uh, this started in 2010. There were a few errors on the map. The Batanes Islands, are, which are not to be confused with the Batana uh, Peninsula. Uh, let's see, uh, this gives me an, what gives me an arrow here? Uh, this? Yeah, red thing. Oh, no, that, uh, the red thing. Uh, okay, let's get straight. Okay. I'm not getting, what am I doing wrong here? Okay, yeah. Okay, the Batanes Islands are actually further north. They were left off. About, uh, not many people live there, about uh, 17 or 18,000, but it is a separate province. The province is going to run rather small in the Philippines. Somehow or another, they either sank into the Pacific over or Taiwan took them over. Now, to make up for the loss of that, this little island down there is uh, southeast of Mindanao was included. There's just one little minor problem with that one. It's Indonesian territory. Uh, and there were a number of other areas. I'm a little surprised, you know. You would have thought they would have, and they're proud. They've done them there, proud of their new notes. But why didn't they get these uh, geographical areas? They have uh, uh, the island of Tablas attached to Panay. It isn't. There's a certain amount of salt water between them. Okay, well, uh, a few days after uh, December 8th, as it was, 
the Jet that's Lim Guyan Bay on Luzon. Now uh, they invaded. Uh, Lu uh, Luzon tends to dominate the Philip, of course, it has Manila, and tends to, it's the largest island in the Philippines, tends to dominate many things in the Philippines. But uh, in emergency paper money, it didn't. Apparently, if you wanted to do any good quality printing, and you're on Luzon, say in 1940 or 39, uh, you went to a printer in Manila. And Manila, of course, became uh, uh, non, uh, unaccessible. There's the Bataan Peninsula, and there's uh, Corregidor. Uh, Corregidor, of course, is not a Philippine name, that's a Spanish name, meaning corrector. When you entered Manila Bay, you went one way or the other way, I think, sort of <laughs> lanes, depending upon which way you went. But all of, oh, oh, keep hitting that one, all of Luzon, uh, from, say, the middle, from the, the uh, Central Valley on down to the Bacol areas, had no uh, emergency money. The Japanese, I think, went to a great, of course, Manila especially, went to a great deal of effort to print it. So uh, Luzon is dominated by, as far as emergency money, that's Cagayan province up there, the mountain province is there, that's Ilocos Norte, uh, all of this is Ilocano in speech. The Filipino languages are all fairly closely related to one another, but they are distinct, you know, some of these are distinct languages, sort of like French, Spanish, and Italian and Romanian, and Romance or the Slavonic ones, the same idea. Uh, they're not necessarily mutually intelligible. Uh, the Babayan Islands to the north there are in fact part of Cagayan province. Okay, let's try another one and get some stuff. Okay, uh, uh, the point is that on Luzon, uh, uh, the best printer in Luzon tends to be, I think, a, one of the a Catholic uh, mission uh, way up there. Cagayan, uh, this is a very famous issue, and I have uh, three of them. What did I do? Okay. Oh, this has got, uh, no, I, I seem to, let's go back. There we are. Okay. Uh, you may be aware of that. Now, to make these things, uh, what do they have available? Well, we'll see some of the stuff that was available. You improvise. Uh, you have plates. Most engraved plates are made of steel. Uh, in the 18th century, they used a lot of copper plates where they directly come, but copper is pretty soft. Lead is very much softer than copper, silver, or gold. And where did the lead come from? Melted down car batteries. I, I, you had to improvise. We'll see some of those shortly. But now these were uh, revenue stamps of the, uh, of the uh, American Filipino government, and um, this continues on up. The most expensive Filipino gorilla note, I don't know if it's necessarily the rarest, is the 200 peso one. There were 100 peso revenue stamps, but they didn't have any in, in uh, northern Luzon at the time. This one has a somewhat weird inscription on it, uh, redeemable after the war in gold coin. <laughs> well, we were no longer on the go. I think what they really just mean is they would redeem it in a U.S. back currency, two pesos to the dollar. Uh, there was a pretty good set of these, including higher values. I got those, those cost me uh, more than $200, so they're, they're not particularly common. And uh, of course, these could be easily guaranteed because the revenue stamps are obviously genuine. Um, okay, now let's try. Oh, I've got to hold this thing down. Huh. Once you jump, I see. I can just push it. Okay. Uh, those and the series from Apeo, uh, these are the ones that were printed on lead plates. Not, it's more like a wood block. It's not an entire impression lead would squish out, I think. But uh, those are the fractionals. Now, the usual fractional denominations are 5, 10, 20, and 50 centavos. You had 20 centavo coins, so 25 centavos is rather unusual. Uh, but we'll see one uh, later on. One centavo is distinctly unusual. Uh, bear in mind you're dealing with 50 cents on the dollar for the peso, uh, so the five cent there is, or five centavos is only two and a half U.S. cents. And uh, we'll see particularly in Negros and uh, Negros Occidental and Cebu, they went to some effort to make rather good quality ones. Okay, uh, those, now the Cagayan, a little unusual, uh, 
they did, uh, there were also two peso notes. Uh, the, the, the normal denominations they used were the same. It was one, two, five, ten, twenty pesos. Fifties and hundreds are not particularly common, and, and five hundreds we'll see some, however. Uh, there they've got Mount Moyon puffing away, uh, and that's in southern Luzon. That's an area where there were not, but it's sort of become a symbol. It's on the, uh, on the U.S.-sponsored coinage. And uh, the, one of the odd things about the Cagayan with the 20, there was no 10 peso note. And these are considerably more abundant. You'll see these on eBay and whatnot. They're considerably more abundant than the, uh, than the revenue stamp ones from Cagayan. Uh, so if you wanted to collect, I, by the way, I have some of, if, if people are interested, I, I didn't bring them with me, but I've got a variety we could negotiate some deals. Uh, uh, one of the neat things is you get these rather crude notes and they're comparatively inexpensive. Um, okay, now, uh, next to Apiao was actually a district in the mountain province. And, but they printed, uh, the, the ones on lead plates were printed at the same place. So the Apeyal notes look very similar to the Cagayan notes. Uh, there we have, uh, when were these done? These are 1942. Now, it varied a bit. Uh, the Japanese were particularly interested, of course, in defeating the American forces and the larger section of the, uh, 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 of the Filipino that, uh, uh, well, we'll get to some of that very shortly. Uh, and they took their time uh, taking over cities, say, in the Visayan Islands and whatnot. Uh, and Apiao, because of its great remoteness, lasted for a while, but uh, eventually by 43, you have places where the notes continue right through the war, 245, Mindanao and some on Negros. Uh, Mindanao, like the Americans were helping them supply them with stuff. But, uh, of course, that's the big southern island. Now, these say something like, oh, yes, payable after the war, uh, et cetera. And quite possibly these were. Uh, the currency ranges from very good quality, that is not in terms of production, but in terms of its redeemability, uh, to stuff that's pretty rot gut, uh, some way overproduced. Uh, there are the Apia, there's also a five uh, peso there. Uh, those, by the way, are the same size as uh, U.S. currency, more or less, which was the Philippine, basically 156 by 66 millimeters, all of these would be able. Now, what do they use for paper? Anything they could get, not toilet paper usually, but uh, you would have, uh, you'll see some of the ELO ELO currencies on very uh, absorbent paper. Uh, I'll show you one here from Negros. You don't want to soak this one in water for too long because it's on craft paper. Craft paper is what, we, well, they're doing more plastic in grocery stores, but those are the brown bags you have in a grocery. And what happens if uh, craft paper, well, as you're well aware with groceries, if you had that accident more than once, uh, it just sort of dissolves. It becomes very weak uh, and will uh, sort of become water soluble. Uh, not good stuff to print uh, notes on. Uh, sometimes they had white bomb paper, occasionally with watermarks. Uh, manila paper, we'll see that. Uh, brown colored, and then there was one quite interesting paper done in, on the island of Negros, and you'd find it in a couple of other uh, gentle, uh, other islands in the central Visayas, uh, called Bais paper, B-A-I-S, that's actually the name of the firm, and the, uh, uh, it's a laid paper, but with broad laid lines, and this could be either horizontal or vertical, depending on how you stick it into the machine. Okay, so there we have these marvelously artistic notes from, uh, which, uh, from Apia, which resemble uh, the, uh, uh, the Cagayan notes done on the lead, the plates made from melted down lead batteries uh, in some remote location in northern Luzon. Is why the, and the same place they printed both the Cagayan and the, and, and the Apia notes, which is why they look the same. Uh, now that's an interesting set, that's a complete set of Ape now it doesn't say Apeyao on it, but the signatures are the same as the last bunch. These are all quite small. They're about 90 by uh, uh, 
50 millimeters roughly. They're smaller than a MPC fractional. They become more or less comparable to, I think, a three cent fractional, uh, if you're familiar with those of the third issue. Different colored papers were used, but this is just paper. Uh, the sort you'd use in a school or something like that. And uh, the, with the, um, uh, well, with the, the signatures, how do you know they're Apia? Well, because the signatures match the last bunch, exactly. They were done a year later. Those were done in 43. But then the Japanese uh, wrecked the joint, and uh, uh, all circulation of this stuff stopped after 43. Notice the 10 peso, same size as the 10 centavo. They were either short on paper, or <laughs> you would think they'd make them bigger, at least to uh, distinguish the fractionals from the, the whole peso denominations. Uh, OK, a locos, I think I had one on here. Let's see, I certainly had something. OK, now the locos norte uh, were done Yes, by a, uh, a governor, Rocky Alblan, his signature appears. He was noted as being very honest. This stuff was not overissued, and a lot was redeemed after the war. Alblan himself uh, disappears after 43. So clearly he was ambushed and uh, executed or otherwise disposed of by the Japanese. Uh, the notes. I keep hitting that. Yeah, okay. They're all, uh, these are relatively scarce. I had, uh, Stax Bowers had a good auction, and I was bidding on my computer with this without, but I was against some, <laughs> I ran this collection of low-cost Norty notes up to about $800, which is probably more than I'd want to pay for that. That is from Neil Schaefer. Now, uh, they were glued together, but the glue got a little weak here. I wasn't even aware of the fact that, it uh, that the glue had sort of come undone. I could re-glue it, but why bother? I mean, it's more interesting this way. You have, this is only for 20 centavos. Now, these go as high as 50 pesos. There are even a few 100 peso notes, but they're very scarce. Uh, but uh, this stuff is rather scarce in part because here's Roque uh, Blanc's signature you can see at the bottom. Uh, and uh, these are rather scarce because the uh, because the uh, they were in fact redeemed. This was actually pretty good money as far <laughs> certainly not very good in terms of production quality, but on uh, their mimeograph, which is one of the techniques available uh, when you're a little hard up. Uh, Thomas D. Larue or the American Banknote Company aren't there in the mountains of northern Luzon to help you out. Ilocos, uh, the uh, language and the people are called Ilocanos. The most famous or notorious, more, more modern Ilocano is Ferdinand uh, Marcos, who was sort of, I think, still regarded in Ilocos Norte as local boy makes good. Uh, but actually, Ablon had a more distinguished, he was, uh, you know, Ferdinand Marcos tried to exaggerate his war record, which wasn't very impressive, I think. Okay, Mountain Province. Let me go back and see if I can give you the statistics. I think we went and this thing jumped so fast that... I put the cog here. Yeah, okay. Now, it's interesting to compare these. Where do I get these from? This is from, I was sort of hoping Neil Schaefer I did see. I think we, in fact, why don't we all just give a, a round of a congratulations to Neil Schaefer while we're at it. I'm hoping he will come out with a new edition of his book, but he did almost all the original work that appears in volume one of the World Paper Money Catalog, including these figures issued. You can see the ones with revenue stamps are a lot less common than the one on lead plates. Uh, there's a pretty good correlation between the availability of the note and the number that were printed. Of course, it may depend also what face values you're using. Apiao is one is a small area in the mountain province, so as one would expect. Uh, uh, we don't have a good record on those mimeograph notes because the uh, printing plant was, this is Neil Schaefer coming in. If so, I'm on, we just gave a round of congratulations. Uh, anyway, that, now these are relatively small productions, as you'll see. These can run into the tens of millions of pesos for some. Okay. So we'll jump ahead now to uh, Alocos Norte. 
And as I say, uh, these are relatively scarce because about 80% were actually redeemed for real money, for victory notes and, and uh, silver coins uh, uh, after the war. Uh, they were, were still honored. Uh, the Japanese, it, it ranged from grudging toleration of the stuff to uh, outright uh, hostility, uh, depending upon how widely it was accepted. But the Alocus Norte was known to be good stuff. In other words, you could buy equipment with it and all sorts. So the Japanese did not like it. And, and it was, uh, I mean, particularly somebody like this uh, blonde guy, uh, they wanted to make sure he was on their hit list. And apparently they got him in 43. And uh, you could have run into trouble holding these. Some of the stuff that was rock got, I don't think, well, we'll talk about some of the, <laughs> keep, it's right where my thumb is, okay. Now, okay, also, and this is about all there is for Luzon, because again, central Luzon, southern Luzon, uh, uh, the Japanese control was too tight. The mountain province is a large province in northern Luzon, actually, Apia is a part of it, uh, 400,000 pesos. Now, the what is that acronym, USA, FFE? You would think it'd be United States. It's United States Armed Forces in the Far East. And these were largely full of this. As you know, MacArthur was, went there for a while. During the late 30s, he was trying to organize their army and whatnot. Uh, these, let's look first. I think I've got the mountain, pro okay, these are mountain province notes. These were done at a, uh, well, St. Mary of the Virgin, the Filipinos, as I you were, are largely Catholic. And they had, uh, th this was probably the best printing press outside of, uh, on Luzon, outside of, uh, outside of Manila, which of course was not accessible. And they printed some halfway decent looking stuff. They did fractionals, the usual denominations, 5, 10, 20, 50 centavos. Uh, then you notice that's a bond, white bond paper, one peso. There's a back of a one peso in Manila paper. They had a second printing in uh, Manila paper. And let's see, here's some, a two, five, here's a 10 on the back. The five look a little odd because the backs are yellow, so they're not very bright on the back side. Uh, these were in use 42, 43. They're moderately common. Uh, uh, or probably the well, uh, the Kagai on on lead plates and the mountain province is the most readily available. Uh, now this is an unusual set. These were done at the same monastery that is uh, printed, uh, and it's got a halfway decent portrait of Franklin Delano Roosevelt there, and you can see United States of America, Luzon, uh, USA, FFE, uh, Guerrilla Army Forces, Philippines. Those are the only two denominations, 100 pesos, 500 pesos. Why such high, they plainly, now how much of these were used, I don't know. About two million were printed. This is the 500 peso, that's only one of two collectible 500 peso notes that you can get. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see the other one, uh, which is in uh, Negros. Uh, uh, they had a certain use, but it would seem their face value would preclude their use for general everyday use. And uh, where were they used? Well, in again, in uh, areas in northern Luzon. Southern Luzon, central Luzon, as far as I can see, the Japanese uh, made sure that none of this stuff circulated. Oh, and this guy is sort of interesting. His name is, is Cushing, uh, who was behind that. He was an American person who was connected with the Filipino forces, and the Japanese even took a certain amount of pride. Rather than being captured, he saved the last bullet for himself, and uh, uh, that's sort of in the style of the Japanese for uh, don't surrender, in other words. Uh, okay, now I put a, another map in here because I want to show you, let's just now, we're switching from northern Luzon let me make sure I get the right button. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay, we're now going down into the Visayan Islands where you have far larger productions because uh, all of you've got the uh, Cebu City uh, on Cebu. It's the second largest city in the Philippines. But the Japanese invasion at the beginning was uh, very much uh, em emphasis in central Luzon. Uh, and, uh, uh, but so they, it, there was a period there from December uh, of 41 
to April of 42, where you still had uh, the old administration in power. And they started printing money and whatnot. Uh, Cebu, although not a very large island, which uh, these things weren't so close together. Uh, 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 let's see, let's do it. Yeah. It's, it's too sensitive. Sorry. Uh, okay. Cebu, although very large, uh, although uh, a rather small island, is very densely populated, and uh, uh, eventually, then it came under uh, rather thorough Japanese control. But they were doing rather good quality notes. So were some of the ones on uh, Negros Occidental, end of '41, beginning of '42, and uh, the so-called Bisayan languages closely related to one another, but you do have some distinctions. Negros is divided into two provinces, for instance, Occidental, and one of them speaks the Alongo form of Bisayan, which is also used in Panay. The other speaks the Cebuano form, which is, has probably as many speakers as, as Tagalog. It's, it's spoken not just in Cebu, but also Bohol, southern Leyte, and all of eastern uh, uh, Mindanao. Uh, uh, the current guy, Duterte, is, was mayor of uh, Davao, which is here. Uh, but you don't get any notes from that. Uh, that apparently, a lot of that became rather thoroughly under Japanese rule. Okay, now let's see if we can hopefully advance one. Okay, Cebu. Now, typical of some of the Visayan Islands, the first notes were basically they would have the name Philippine National Bank. And the banks operated, but uh, what happened to the Philippine silver coins and uh, the BEP printed uh, paper money? It disappeared rather fast. Uh, people put a, <laughs> hid the stuff. I mean, uh, they didn't have to worry about gold coins, but silver coins. Uh, what happened to a good many of the silver coins? I think you're well aware uh, that uh, they dumped a lot in Manila Bay. They were later recovered, mostly, uh, the sea salvage ones, and you can get uh, that, but there was the mint was in in, the, in Manila there, and and they probably took whatever silver they had and just dumped it out in Manila Bay without telling the Japanese just where they dumped it. Okay, now you're looking at much larger productions. There was the so-called emergency currency notes for the Philippine National Bank, 11 million. Uh, well, then there's an emergency currency board. Okay, now uh, these were rather. There's even a five centavo. Bear in mind that's only two and a half U.S. cents, rather well printed, uh, considering the circumstances. These were done by the whatever the best printer was on in Cebu City. Uh, the one peso, one guy had followed up. It's a, a blue on one side, orange. They made about uh, a million of those. Even it really doesn't have any specific varieties, but he was getting hand stamps. And this is one of the later ones that oh no, that still has Philippine National Bank on it. Yeah, oh yeah, very much so. This is one issued in Cebu for the Philippine National Bank. Uh, okay, now Panay, well, we've got Negros in between, but Panay is the westernmost of the main Visayan Islands. The capital is Iloilo, and Iloilo Province uh, uh, had, you can see, uh, well, a, a huge production. These are uh, 50 million pesos total. Now, what happened? Uh, at the beginning, again, the city of Iloilo was not taken over directly. Uh, not immediately. I mean, of course, it was taken over. All the major cities would have been taken by, over by the Japanese. Uh, apparently, there's enough uh, wilderness on Panay or obscure areas. So you had two different uh, production centers for these, and these turned out to be rivals of each other. There's uh, the Dialosa issues, which were supposed to be for the military, and the Villalon issues, which were supposed to be for civilians, but uh, it was a question of who can produce more notes. Uh, 20 peso notes of the Dialosa issues are, are uh, common, and uh, I think they made a few more. There was no way you would have redeemed all of these. Okay, uh, this is uh, some of these, the Villa Lawn issues, there's a 50, uh, are printed 
uh, have the same design as the, as the original ELO, ELO issues with a victory and, a, and whatnot. 50 pesos is a relatively obscure denomination. Nice, bright uh, uh, red-violet shade, yes, but it's printed on a very absorbent, not quite toilet paper, but <laughs> something approaching clean. It's a very soft, absorbent paper. Uh, they were hard out for getting good quality paper here on the island of Panay, at least in the more obscure areas. Um, there are some uh, backs. Uh, uh, there's a one peso. 20 peso, for some odd reason, uh, in this bunch is very, uh, very rare, but they have the 50s. This is a later production down below, and uh, you can see still having the name of the Philippine National Bank on them. Um, and again, these were predominantly for civilian use. Now, uh, they say, look at the portraits to, uh, to uh, establish the quality of a note, uh, at least on American notes, so we have these fine engraved portraits of all. Well, now here on, in uh, rural Panay, here we have MacArthur, Kazan, and Roosevelt. They want to make very clear what side they're on. Uh, but um, those are not exactly what you would call huge uh, qual uh, <laughs> You know, wildly authentic portraits, but it's as good as they could do in rural Panay. Uh, and the 20 peso especially is very common. Uh, those are dated either 42 or 44, but they were also making them in 43. Uh, and uh, uh, these are the so-called Dialosa issues. Now there we have, uh, oh, that one is a, a counterfeit, which is as good quality if you compare them you'll find the lettering's a little different. I think these were made on uh, uh, some island, probably uh, in some other place. Uh, but the, this stuff, of course, as one might expect, became rot gut. I mean, 20 peso, uh, those green ones with Roosevelt, are not rare notes. I mean, you can probably find them for three or four bucks each or something like in reasonably decent condition. They also made 100. They didn't make a 50. Now, there we have Mount uh, Mayon in southern Luzon puffing away. It's not an island in Penang. But I, that, uh, they, they're in two serial number bunches. They're ones with low serial numbers and ones up uh, approaching 300,000. Neil Schaefer had a beautiful one uh, that I would have uh, loved to have gotten, but except uh, the re but I wanted a counterfeit. This, this one, well, both that one was a counterfeit. This one was rather well counterfeited. And what are the counterfeits worth? About the same as the genuine notes. I mean, we're talking, when we say counterfeit, I mean, of course, contemporary. With the time. And now that's, again, a relatively scarce denomination. So while the other side of Panay was making those purple 50, uh, 50 paces, they were, they were making orange one with not my own on, not on Panay, however. Okay, Negros is between Cebu and, uh, and Panay. It is a sugar growing uh, place. Uh, heavily uh, sugar fields. I don't know why they, how they were able to find areas that the Japanese didn't take over. It's divided into two provinces, Negros, Ossetental, which they speak the uh, Ilongo form of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Visayan, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, Negros uh, Oriental, which had much lower production, where they speak the Cebuano form and where the uh, apparently, they were very heavily relying on Cebu. Now, there were about there were several different groups here that were operating. You can see the really big one in terms of production is the Negroes Emergency Currency Board, and this was out in the sugar fields or somewhere. Uh, the major city, at least in Negros uh, uh, Occidental, is Bacolod, and like Cebu, they had uh, a pretty good printing. Um, Okay, uh, here we have Filipino. Notice the difference. Some of them have a Filipino National Bank thing. Some of them use the uh, the coat of arms of the uh, of the Commonwealth Commonwealth of the Philippines. Uh, uh, they they didn't go above uh, ten pesos in this bunch. And there were also some twos in here. They had everything from bearer checks. But basically, you can see what would happen. You had an interim of a few months when things still proceeded normally, but. Silver coins probably disappeared overnight, and, uh, and the BEP stuff disappeared pretty fast. Obviously, they couldn't get new supplies of it. So these were notes printed. Uh, to, so if you went in to get your wages or something like that, late December, 
uh, uh, 41, or January or February of 42 at a Philippine National Bank branch. This is what they'd pay you in. Not really guerrilla notes. Uh, I think the term guerrilla implies you've got some clandestine fighters out in the woods. See? We'll see the Cooley and Leper, that was, that was the medical staff who printed these. Okay, now those are the, uh, they had the usual denominations, but the five centavos are rather common. The ten centavo is actually quite scarce. Uh, got that one from Neil Schaefer. And now here's a, a halfway decent portrait of, uh, of Manuel uh, Quezon. Uh, and here's some two, five. Uh, sometimes the peso reads in or other, some varieties on this, but the printing quality is pretty good. The interesting thing, and, and, and Neil Schaefer seems to have done it quite well, is determining how many of these were printed, what range of serial numbers, etc. And now Negros is where they made the uh, bias paper with this laid paper. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up very well on slides. I mean, I had a, the notes here, you, you could see it. It's an interesting laid paper. That was used on some of the notes. Uh, they all seem to have case on rather than, say, Roosevelt or MacArthur or some other person. Okay, now this is actually a different group, the same island. The Japanese clearly occupied major cities on Negroes like uh, Bacolod. And uh, so that put that group out of business. But now somewhere on the island, out in the sugar field somewhere, uh, you had the Negroes Emergency Currency Board, and that goes right to 45. Uh, they didn't issue a two peso, but they're uh, using all sorts of different paper. Uh, manila paper, bond paper, various colors, different printings. Uh, the tw the, the uh, up through 10, they're rather small. Now this stuff was produced in substantial quantities, and certainly, uh, what happened to some of this stuff? Well, a lot of it, I think, was circulated at a certain, at a heavy discount from its actual face value. In other words, if you're paying in silver coins, that's what you rarely would be doing. That would be one rate. But if you're paying in this stuff, you're going to have to settle on 10 centavos on the peso or something like that. Uh, they had, uh, 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 this is the same outfit, the Negro's Emergency Currency Board. Uh, those I got from the Philippines, those are actually, as far as I'm concerned, uncirculated. Of course, they're not, they don't crackle like, <laughs> like U.S. there. I'm rather, bear in mind, the paper isn't the greatest, but you do have 50. And, and this is the only other, with that, except for that Marlon Lausanne one, this is the only other 500 peso note that's collectible. And it's always signed, if we look at the back side of this, uh, this is always signed by uh, two individuals, or is it three individuals? The signatures. Are, are well known. They're described in, in Schaefer's book. And that's what the back sides of these things look like. Okay, these were also Negros. This is now the Negros, uh, the one at the bottom. That's Negros Occidental or no Oriental, uh, and uh, uh, that's an area that again they speak the same, exactly the same language as on Cebu. And I had ties with Cebu. They didn't issue many notes, the ones they did issue. Now, the top one is not one you want to soak in water for any prolonged period to clean off a stain or anything. If you did, that's made of, it's printed on craft paper, the, the same paper that they use for brown, or they used to use, I think they still do, for uh, grocery bags. Uh, it'll sort of dissolve with time. It says Army of the United States of America. It was a special military issue that was separate from the uh, from the currency board. As far as I know, the currency board, a Negro's emergency, mostly just printed paper money in a uh, very substantial amount, because, <laughs> including the 500 peso notes. Okay, now, uh, the other islands of the Sias, uh, Samar and Leyte, uh, you know, some islands are very common, others are not particularly. Samar doesn't have any, any single, it's actually the third largest island in the Philippines, but it doesn't have any particular city that dominates it in the way that, uh, say, Panay is dominated by Ilo Ilo, and uh, it's mostly more local stuff. Leyte had a currency board, but I mentioned that let's look at some of the, okay, here we have, this is Leyte, this I got from Neil, now that has Tacloban, that's the largest town in Leyte, and uh, that, uh, that was recently devastated by a typhoon, and, but uh, that's about as good as you could come up with Leyte. Now, the top one, 
is a Cebu note. But note the, if you look at the inscription, it's upside down. It's a little tricky to read. Anyway, it's domiciled to some town on Leyte. And this was standard. We'll see another one of this sort. Sometimes if you don't have as good printing, they would take notes of Cebu, notes of particularly Negros, Osses, and Tal, and then hand stamp them so that these would be doing. What about the interconvertibility of these notes? Uh, well, uh, in effect, although uh, in theory they may have been to some extent interconvertible, they basically worked only in the places where they were intended. The local ones only really in the, the town or city. The provinces presumably would work anywhere in Leyte, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, well, sometimes that is the only money that was available other than the Thapi. I don't know what uh, exactly that means in Tagalog, but I expect it's not very common. That's the Japanese stuff. Uh, and we'll talk a, a little about the uh, conversions there. Now, those are from Samar, but these are local issues. Uh, that's three Ginan there, that's uh, what is Orcas, I think, yeah, Oras, uh, and that's Balangiga. Those are, were issued by municipality. There's one weird issue uh, from Samar that were printed on election forms. And they're of all things, uh, the inscriptions are in Spanish. Apparently they were old, or I believe they're not just English and Spanish. We'll see some with Filipino inscriptions too. But anyway, these are various. They had, uh, Samar did, although there was some currency board there, didn't issue many notes. Most of the Samar stuff tends to be local issues from different places. I have a one peso, which is, really cruddy. I think I paid fairly good money out of it. So the, some of these aren't too common. The, the, the ball and giga ones and, and the bottom one I got from Neil Schaefer is, is not. Uh, that's for a town called Ginan in uh, southern Samar. Okay, now we have a few other. This is, okay, well you can see compared to the millions of pesos in Negros Asadal, especially the Negros Emergency Currency Board, very few, those are the two that we're mentioning, but Negros Oriental issued hardly any notes. Uh, Bohol is that egg-shaped island next to Cebu, and uh, they, the little, uh, they probably issued quite a few more than that. There, there are quite a few Masamas. Uh, uh, Asadental is on them now, we'll see a few of those. Okay, this is Bohol, and uh, these are common. Uh, the, one of the interesting things, however, is they had a 25 centavo note as opposed to 25 as opposed to 20 centavos as I said a fraction because the coins were 20. Uh, uh, so that's as far as I know the only 25 centavo but they're not rare at all uh, so if you need to get a denomination set of Philippine emergency money these went to 10 pesos uh, let's see did they issue a two I believe they didn't it was just one five and ten but twos are two pesos that is are quite standard and they would have various signatures. The colors of these range from sort of dark, you know, real black to sort of dull gray. I think it's just how much ink was in the printer at the time. And uh, uh, as I say, they made, uh, there were some mines on Bohol. It's pretty tied in with Cebu, but the Japanese didn't occupy as thoroughly as they did Cebu. Uh, okay, well, I'm putting this back in here because, now let me see if I can press this. Uh, Mindanao, of course, is the very, <laughs> what happened there? It's going to be awfully good. I can, okay, uh, let's hope I can get to those, that set again without, I'm sorry, the problem most of these were a lot further apart. I touch one with my finger and it goes, Bonkers on it. Mindanao is the large southern island, uh, second only to Luzon in size. Uh, the eastern half is overwhelmingly Christian, very largely Cebuano in speech. Uh, the area around, there's a, a large lake in the interior there, Lake Lanao. This, and particularly Cotobato down there, is heavily Muslim. Uh, the islands to the south. Uh, particularly that island, which is pronounced Holo, although it's spelled J-O-L-O, uh, but it's not Joel. That is very Islamic. The, uh, uh, the Filipino Muslims have caused some, uh, neither the Spanish 
the Americans, the Japanese, nor the present independent Republican government in the Philippines have been able to totally control this area. Uh, the, uh, there is a movement for independence. I mean, they, they're fairly militantly Muslim. They're not, uh, uh, and there have been some problems. The Spanish refer to them as Moros. The Moro, it just means more in Spanish. So, I mean, it was, uh, they were the Philippine Muslims. Okay, now let's look at what we've got here. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to, let's see, can I do that? Say this machine goes bonkers if you hit the wrong. We'll just flip through these. We'll get to Mindanao here shortly. Yeah, that was the one I was. Okay, Masamas, these are from Masamas. It had a separate board, separate from all of it's on the island of Mindanao. It had a sec. What about eastern Mindanao, the major city there of Davao? Apparently, the Japanese controlled it rather tightly. There's no emergency money from uh, eastern Mindanao. But from the more uh, western sections, you do have some. Not particularly the Islamic sections, but uh, this is Masamas, uh, which has ties in with uh, Cebu and Negros. Okay, now, emergency, that's, we'll see that, the Don Salam. Notice the enormous production, this is called after the facts, but it's in the, uh, the enormous production for the latter stuff from Mindanao. This continues up to 45. Mindanao is a very large island. It was possible for Americans with submarines and such to supply the people who were printing this stuff, uh, you know, paper, uh, inks, things like that. So they were able uh, to, uh, uh, to produce this stuff in quantity. In fact, the quality maintains about the same. Uh, uh, lots of 10 and 20 peso notes. They didn't issue 50s or 100s, but large numbers of those. Uh, okay, now uh, here we have, these are the Mindanao, this is uh, not the Misamis, this is the other group. The one at the bottom is uh, an issue from, uh, uh, from this uh, Don Salam, a town in northern uh, Mindanao. These were issued early in the game, but most of these are productions of the so-called Second Emergency Committee. Th those are the low, uh, there was the usual fractional, 5, 10, 20, and 50 centavos, uh, and a one peso. Uh, but the thing you especially see are the 2, 5, 10, and 20, especially the 10 and 20, lots of them. Now the inscription on the back includes uh, ones in Filipino, uh, basically Tagalog, uh, and uh, uh, mostly they were using English rather than Tagalog on the notes, but uh, this is one where they use both languages. Uh, these obviously were produced in quantity. There are quite a few, uh, uh, try this one without hopefully making the thing, see the BB there. Uh, you'd have different series, uh, different uh, letters there to identify a particular one. You can collect these. Uh, easy enough to do because uh, these are inexpensive. And if you want to get, I could, if anyone are interested, I have a, a fair duplicate stock of some of these things, and you could probably find them on the floor. There's sometimes even in the, not so much in the, in the dollar box or the 50 cent box, but you'll find them in the two dollar boxes, I think, by uh, some people who have those. Uh, there are the 20s. Now the one at the bottom is a counterfeit. And if you look at the size, it doesn't agree exactly. It's on manila paper. Uh, and there are little subtle differences in the script. Where were these printed? Usually not in Mindanao. Somewhere else, uh, you had a mixture of stuff circulating. And uh, this stuff was more tolerated by the Japanese simply because it was pretty much rot gut itself. There was a weird, very cynical, uh, so-called redemption of notes by this incredible generosity. This, the Japanese had the puppet government. It has the same name. Uh, I mean, uh, Jap uh, Filipino uh, control, uh, one would assume all uh, Filipinos were strongly in favor of the American. No, no, don't forget, this was a colonial regime. And, uh, uh, and uh, you no, know, some of them, uh, uh, Aquino's father was an active, uh, not the reporter who got assassinated, but his father was an active collaborator. And the uh, Jose Laurel, 
was the president of the so-called Republic, Kang Pilipinas, same name it is today, but same flag too. Uh, and then the Jose Vargas, who was mayor of Manila, uh, these were some of the leading collaborators. And they, the Japanese had them redeem uh, this stuff for FAPI, for the, <laughs> what sometimes is called Japanese invasion money. And uh, one form of uh, rot gut money being exchanged for another. But the redemptions weren't very effective. They wanted to get this stuff out of circulation, the Japanese did, uh, because it was, you know, they wanted to indicate they were the real, uh, really in charge there, but uh, in a lot of areas they were not. Uh, uh, they certainly were in central Luzon, but that doesn't apply to all these other areas. Where were the Mindanao notes printed? They were printed in Mindanao, but bear in mind it's a very large island, and so uh, the American you know, submarine could always find some place to land and, you know, and they would turn over to the local people who were printing this stuff, uh, paper and supplies. So this continues up to, I think, the, there's a series 44, uh, the 20 there. Here's, you notice the bilingual inscription on the back side. Okay, Palawan's sort of an interesting, that's that long skinny island. Uh, the flora, the, uh, flora and fauna of Palawan resemble Borneo more than most of the, and it's wired by short. It was one of the, actually the earliest islands to be inhabited. You're probably well aware that the uh, Philippines are, I mean, they're an Austronesian language. I mean, I, I was comparing with a Filipino note. Uh, uh, we were counting one to ten. I was doing it in Te Reo Maori, Maori language of New Zealand, and she was doing Tagalog, and about half the uh, names for the letters, or for the numbers one to ten were quite similar. Okay, Palawan did not have a very central authority. Neil Saber does a particularly good job on this. It's always been a frontier island, uh, with at one time about only, I think, 100,000 people on it at the time uh, of 1940. It's more like a million today. I mean, uh, they're saying, uh, if, you, if you go to the website, you'll find all these places have chamber of commerce type things, and they make out Palawan the most beautiful island in the world, and a few other things, although there are problems. Now, what are the, the, one of the most interesting series is, are the Kulian leper colony. They're on the island of Kulian. It's in Palawan province, but to the north of, and uh, if you're familiar with the Philippine coinage, there was special coinage made for uh, the Kulian leper colony. And, well, okay, out of aluminum mostly. Uh, and, uh, okay, there is some Kulian leper now. As I say, one reason I don't prefer curling uh, 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 Philippine gorilla money, some of it was, but not all of it, uh, who made these things? The medical staff of the Cullian leper colony. And this circulated from the first, about the first half of 1942. Uh, somewhere in there, the Japanese arrived and put an end to the circulation of clan, what as far as they were concerned was clandestine money. Uh, uh, the uh, Centavo denominations are, are on pink paper. This is sort of a bluish gray. You'll find some stains. They tended to dip these in melted wax to uh, preserve them a little better. Uh, I think this one now has, let's see, let me be very careful how I touch this. Is this the one of these? Ah, yeah, it's this one. This is the so-called error. It says 20. Well, it was an overprint. It was, it was for 50 centavos, but uh, it was overprinted on 20. They had five, they had one and five. The, um, uh, this is one of the few collectible, and we'll hit the next, but the, the peso notes are just one, five, and 20. They didn't bother with tens and twos, I think, because they felt the, the range was enough. M what are they? Those are mimeographed and, uh, they sometimes have inscriptions on the back side. Okay, fine. Well, we're getting toward the end here. This is, uh, I got this on eBay. You would wonder, is this genuine? The answer is yes. How do I know? Because I, I know the, I got from David, the one centavo, and it matches exactly the paper quality, everything. That's an unissued sheet, uh, or an unissued half sheet, actually. They were printed in sheets of it, of the, uh, of the uh, Cullian Leper Colony, one centavo. Now that's only half an American cent. Why they needed things that low, I don't know. Maybe things were cheap to the patients there. And, but in any case, um, 
it, it was, uh, doesn't have the serial numbers on it, but it was, you can see, it has a 1942 date. Uh, quite an unusual item. And now the last one I've got on here, press this, yes, there we are. Uh, oh, yeah, the top, that's a Negros uh, Ossetan tall note, but notice one of those hand stamps again. That was for Puerto Princesa, the chief city on the island of Palawan. So in other words, that was saying they didn't have the facilities to add to print these that they would have had in Bacalod, so in Negros. Uh, uh, this is what they could come up with. That That is from Brooks's point. Brooks, this is uh, Sir James Brooks. He's the guy who founded the White Raja, who founded Sarawak. Uh, and as I say, the ties with Borneo and Palawan are fairly strong, although not by now. They uh, different regime there. But anyway, that's a two peso note. There were various quite crude notes from Palawan. And, well, uh, that's all for us. Now, anyone want to comment on those? I can, if any of you really would even want to form a collection, I can uh, check with me. I don't have, I do, but I mean, I'm back in Pennsylvania. I do have some. Anyone want to comment on any of, of that stuff? Uh, it's very clear that given the huge abundance today of ELO, ELO, say particularly 20 peso notes, those green ones with Roosevelt, or Mindanao, 10 and 20 uh, peso notes, that a lot of the stuff was not redeemable. Given your choice, you know, given one of those 20 peso notes. Oh, I'd like to have one of the victory notes with Mount Moyon on them. You'll notice the price difference is quite substantial between them. Uh, some of it, as I say, was good, was good money, like a locus norte, and I don't know just all what the situation. The FAPI was totally rejected. You're probably aware there was a thousand peso toward the very end, actually issued up in northern Luzon by uh, retreating Japanese forces toward the end. Uh, and uh, well, anyway, it's an interesting series of, of uh, I would say, delightfully crude. You're not seeing anything very aesthetic there, and uh, I lower. I, keep the dividing line, but sometimes you have to settle on very good on sometimes, but uh, don't expect GEMCU for any of this stuff. <laughs>